somebody turned it off. <laughs> Thank you. The recorded signal is stored as tape flux. The tape recorder converts an electrical voltage in time into flux in space, and that, that is down the length of the magnetic tape. One of the requirements for professional tape recording is that different blank tapes and different recorders and different reproducers must all play the recordings interchangeably. So we need to be able to measure the flux quantitatively so we can circulate that around. We do that at Magnetic Reference Lab using the fundamental methods of traditional physics. But sound recording studios have neither the knowledge nor the equipment to do that. So how do they get interchangeability? Well, from the beginning in the 1940s, tape recorder manufacturers or the user groups of the day have made and sold recordings variously called standard tapes or alignment tapes or test tapes that are used to adjust both the home and, stu and the studio tape recorders to play and record in a standard way. That is to say a standard level of standard frequency response. They're now officially called calibration tapes. Making calibration tapes requires a signal generator and a tape recorder. Then you need a controller system first to set the tape recorder speed, equalization, and flux. Then to start and stop the tape. Then to generate the desired program of announcements, tones, levels, times that constitute a calibration tape. Our controller is a PC computer controlled by PC Forth. That's the subject of this talk. A little history for Magnetic Reference Lab, which is my company. We founded it in 1972 when several of us were dumped out of Ampex with the goal of manufacturing standard tapes. At first we used custom modified Ampex tape transports and electronics with a manually controlled switching system similar to the one that had been used at Ampex for making standard tapes, and an Ampex PR10 tape recorder to provide the voice announcements and the timing. By the late 1970s, we had enough profits to purchase better tape recorders. We asked the engineers at Capitol Records in Hollywood, and they said, come down for a visit. I did, and they showed us what they were using and what they recommended, which was a Studer A80 tape transport. So we bought two of these, one set up to be convertible for quarter and half inch tape, the other set up to be convertible for one and two inch tape. And we hired a full-time engineer, an ex-Ampex employee, Dick Lowe, to develop the electronics for the tape recorder and the signal generating electronics and a computer controlled uh, system for making what we now call calibration tapes. I had purchased an HP 35 RPN calculator in 1972 so I knew and used RPM. Hello. And I had an Apple II computer at home and had bought a fourth program for it and started attending the FIG meetings at... Hello? He's muting it. Huh? Uh, and attended the, the FIG meetings at the Southland Mall in Hayward. At MRL, we, bought, we first bought a... Commodore 64 computer with a floppy disk storage and got Tom Zimmer's fourth for it to start learning how to program with fourth since we were both novice computer programmers. I had done some... Yeah, okay. In 1981, according to my recollection, IBM introduced their personal computer and soon there were affordable PC copies available so we bought one changed over to, to Tom Zimmer's fourth for the PC, the FPC, for which 
Dr. King wrote the, the manuals, which are very useful. We still use this old DOS version because updating the fourth programs would be a lot of work and I cannot see that it has any advantage for our particular use since we only use it in our recording system. We updated the tape player, which had been uh, an Ampex PR10 that has the announcements first to a broadcasting tape cartridge, if you know those. They're not very reliable and the timing is not very accurate. Then to a tape cassette, which worked pretty well. Uh, Heath kit had a, a digital voice system with eight bits. It sounded terrible and it was really not usable. Finally, they came out with a 16-bit hard disk audio recorder, and that's what we use now. We plot the output of the tape recorder signal on an HP 7475A graphic plotter. And look, can we see that? Uh, the, the graph. The graph, okay. And thanks to Kevin, who did my graphics for me. Ah, I'm a little too close. So this is, this is the plot that we make for each of the tapes that we record, a little descriptive text. Ah. <clears throat> um, the staves that give the levels and the, the frequencies that are recorded. And it's plus or minus one dB here. So it, it's two tenths per, per division. Uh, it plots in red, and you can almost see the red lines there that the, the <laughs> plot the level versus time. Yeah, and it shows the tape wiggles. Oh, you can actually see it there. Good. So we, we plot the recorder output signal on an HP 7475A graphic plotter with an RS-232C interface. So the operator can check as the manufacturing goes on if there are uncorrected dropouts and other possible problems and cancel recording immediately if that happens. Uh, we have a word that says stop now question mark that we put into all the, the looping programs that go on for, for time. And um, so if you push the escape button, it, even though it's in a, long, a couple of minute time loop, it will drop it out. The MRL FPC basic control system now runs to 37 SEQ files. And the programs to make standard tapes are 54 files. The paper files printed single-sided are about 50 millimeters thick. So I just am going to talk about a, a selection of pieces here. Second item, the part numbers. When we started, we rather arbitrarily chose six-digit part numbers for our calibration tapes. But these soon showed to be inadequate to identify all the various calibration tapes that we would make. So we changed to a 12-digit coded part number, which we identify uh, the first digit is, is the medium, which can be any one of four different tape widths, <coughs> four speeds that are standard, and three standard equalizations. 
we have provision for a thousand different programs with, with different contents, 30 different flux, fluxivities, two track widths uh, for the reproducer to be used, and, and uh, a digit for the package, the duration, and a simple check digit. <clears throat> when the operator goes to record the tape, he types into the computer the numbers, the 15 digits. And these set up the tape speed, the equalization, the program of tones to record, the track configuration, total duration, time, and it warns the operator if there's er an error in the part number. We used to make calibration tapes for broadcasting cartridges, but the lubricated tape used for that and the cartridges are no longer available. We considered making calibration tapes for compact cassettes, but we never did it. It's a lot of work for a crummy little system that doesn't ever work very well, as far as I'm concerned. When it's uh, set up perfectly, it makes pretty good recordings, but it's never set up perfectly. Uh, we have provision for a thousand different programs of test signals. People want different frequencies, different sequences, different tones of uh, durations of the tones. The, um, yeah. the label, where'd it go? No, no, I still you want, need... You still, still need the uh, Still need plot. it for a yeah, for a second. Sorry. <laughs> the, <laughs> the label, which just disappeared, there we go, gives the basic information about the tape. And that is, yeah, that's a, um, what's the Adobe language? Postscript? Postscript. That's a postscript uh, readout of, the, of our part number. So you put in the part number and it uh, decodes and, and prints that on an impact printer on a on a, 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 a series of, of uh, labels. Something about the system hardware, because of its specialized nature, we built most of the system our ourselves. There's an interconnect to the PC that uses a JDR board uh, and was programmed by a friend of, of one of my kids who was a, a, a computer whiz. Um, by the way, it's, it's curious. Uh, we got a, a lot of parts from, from JDR who used to be down in, in San Jose. I found out recently they are in the building at 229 Polaris, which is the building that MRL was in. Uh, for about 20 years or so when we, start, when we started. The other system hardware is a, a si signal generation and control. We have a digitally controlled oscillator that makes tones and we can make sweeps with programs. We use the digital sound blaster uh, on the hard drive for the voice announcements. We have a white noise and a pink noise generator and a generator of a, of a special test signal for checking the polarity of the tape recorder. We have the HP plotter, level plotter that makes a graph. Um, we need to do transport controls. We need motion controls, stop, play, fast forward, rewind. We need to control the speed of the transport. There are four different speeds that are commonly used in professional audio. And um, we have a speed control bus that, that controls how fast it runs. 
for the electronics, there's a block diagram now. I'd like to have that. Yeah, <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Well, you, I can explain what it is. These, these are the, the, the modules that uh, do the various control functions for the tape recorder. The first one up here is a servo gain control. It measures the input voltage, and it measures the voltage that comes from the playback head. Uh, and it takes the ratio integrates that, because if you don't, the system goes from full on to full off. Uh, and it, it uh, keeps the level constant, even though the tape thickness may vary as it goes. Then there's a, a uh, recording equalizer. Uh, the frequency response equalizer, I'll talk about these some more later. Another frequency response equalizer to trim the high frequency response. And a, an attenuator so we can set the recording level. Then it gets the signals, uh, the audio and the bias get mixed and put into, the, into a voltage to current converter into the recording head. Then uh, down on the playback head, uh, a standard playback head reads rate of change of the flux, so it it uh, differentiates the signal. So we integrate that, and we go through. This is a set up the uh, recording and reproducing speed and equalization. Uh, select the flexibility. These are other equalizers, uh, and a, a standard equalizer, I'll talk about this later, and a two-pole low-pass filter that we use for a gap-loss equalizer, and it comes out over here. So those are the, the pieces, and this shows the, uh, the control bus, uh, the Gain control needs to know about the, the speed of the tape and the time delay. Um, these equalizers need to know what the speed of the controls the equalization. And down here, yeah. Something about the recording equalizer. The tape recorder converts a signal in time to a distance on a tape. So we often convert time to the equivalent distance using the relationship that the wavelength equals speed divided by frequency. <clears throat> in sound recording, four different speeds are commonly used in open reel, which is the usual for studio recorders. Three and three quarters, seven and a half, fifteen, and thirty inches per second. The slowest speed is the most economical of tape to use, but the highest speed gives the best quality, so we make tapes across that whole range. <clears throat> we therefore need a speed bus that tells the, the motor how fast to run, tells the equalizers how to, to shift them. There are, are several elements in a tape recorder and reproducer that have non-flat frequency and or wavelength responses. The tape recording process itself falls 6 dB an octave and then 12 dB an octave with decreasing wavelength, which is to say infrequ increasing frequency. So that loss has to be made up somewhere, somehow. 
The reproducing head response increases 6 dB an, an octave, uh, and so it needs an integrator, in other words, falling 6 dB an octave, to get flat response. In tape recording, as opposed to reproducing, when you record a constant current versus frequency, there's a redu reduction in the recorded flux with increased frequency, or really decreasing wavelength. The recorded flux drops 6 dB an octave starting at a certain frequency, really wavelength, and then two octaves later an additional 6 dB an octave for an ultimate rate of 12 dB an octave. So that has to be equalized. The starting wavelength is determined mainly by the thickness of the oxide coating, which is explained in published papers. In practice, this is compensated partly in recording and partly in reproducing. In commercial tape recorders, the reproducer has an integrator that compensates for the repro head, which is a differentiator, which drops, which stops integrating at some middle frequency in the range of 2 to 10 kilohertz that's standardized in the U.S. by the National Association of Broadcasters, called NAB, and in the United, that's used in the United States and by the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is IEC, internationally, or in practice, every place but the United States. Then the recording equalizer compensates for the rest of the recording high-frequency loss. So we see the pieces for doing that up there. But for the purposes of making calibration tapes, it's convenient for us to arrange the equalizing circuits in an unusual way. When the recording and reproducing standard frequency modules, number two, uh, I need the whole thing, Kevin. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, having a problem. Yeah. When this module is set for flat response, and this module is set for flat response, then the recording equalizer, which is this 26 dB an octave lift, and this equalizer, which is a little additional trim, when those are set for flat, then uh, constant input voltage produces a constant tape flux, which is actually what they do in instrumentation recording, but not audio. So the, the part number sets these things to the appropriate values. The recording equalization depends on the recording speed and the tape coating thickness. So we need to have a recording equalizer that gives the two high frequency boosts. And it needs to, needs to shift with the tape speed, which is in a 1, 2, 4, 8 progression. And we have a, a bus here that, that shifts the equalizers by octaves. Another unit that we use that, that is necessary for making calibration tapes is what we call a servo gain control. And that's this thing up here at the input. Um, the sensitivity of magnetic tape depends on the thickness of the oxide coating. Modern tape manufacturers control the thickness very closely, but there are still variations. To control this, we built this an analog servo gain control. It measures the voltage of the input signal and the output signal, in other words, the recorded signal, measures the ratio of them, 
and uses that to control a multiplier in the recording signal path. An integrator stabilizes the gain, otherwise the gain will oscillate between zero and infinity and just jump back and forth, which is, of course, unusable. Um, when we built this unit, I couldn't find any theory of how to stabilize a feedback system with a time delay. All of the standard theories um, were based on phase response. <clears throat> I used an HP Odier, a pocket calculator that had a plotter with it. And I made a, a, a stepwise approximation of changing level and applying the feedback to control. And from that, I got an idea of what integrator gains I would need to stabilize the system. The integrator, integrator gain depends on the time delay between the recording and the reproducing. And there's a lookup table to give the optimum gain for the distance between the recording and reproducing heads and the speed under consideration. The control words are SGC off, where the gain is fixed at unity, SGC hold, which keeps the last used value of gain, SGC on, where the SGC controlling gain is such as to keep the output equal to the input, and an SGC reset that uh, resets the gain unity with the input left as it was. Um, something about controls. Some elements need to emulate a momentary push button. For instance, the transport controls for starting and stop, stopping the tape motion. So we made words that would uh, take a uh, a data point and set it to from zero to one and then back to zero in, in 10 or 20 mi um, milliseconds. Some elements need to initiate, to imitate a multipole switch, for instance, switching between several g signal generators. Some elements need a numerical input, for instance, to control the frequency of the oscillator, including to make a frequency sweep sine wave, which the frequency is just swept up on a repeating loop, or numerical input to control the position of the pen on the plotter for plotting data versus time. Um, making a standard tape. The operator first sets up the recorder Input the part. You put inputs the part number, which sets the speed, the equalization controls. He loads a blank tape on the recorder. He records a thousand hertz tone with the SGC off, then manually sets the bias and the recording gains. Then he records a frequency sweep tone and sets the recording loss equalizer, module three for flat response in the mid-frequency range. Then he sets the recording module 4 as needed to trim the very high frequencies. The recording equalizer, module 3, is connected to the speed bus. So we can make uh, recordings at two or three speeds. In other words, the program that is selecting the frequencies and levels and such uh, can stop the tape recorder and change the speed, change the equalizations, um, and wait a time. The Studer tape recorder is an in, uses uh, for the capstan an induction motor if they use, the, they set up the pole so that it will run, if it's run with full input voltage, it'll run um, about 33 inches per second. So by reducing that voltage, you can have any lower speed that you need. 
the problem is that it takes anywhere from almost not well if you change from one speed to the same speed it takes no time if you change from the highest to the lowest speed it takes quite a while the capstan motor has a, a big flywheel on it and it takes quite a while to drift down in speed so if we're making a multi-speed tape um, we stop we look up a value in a table for how long it's going to take it to drop in speed and then we started to get start the, the tape recorder again it also changes the gain in the SGC integrator so it's appropriate uh, a little on the voice announcements the, we announce the frequencies and levels on all the tones uh, originally it was done by splicing together pieces on an analog tape recorder with the two track tape one track had the voice announcement, it would say, you know, 1,000 hertz. And the other track just had a tone. I forget what frequency, but when the tone was on, uh, it switched the tape recorder input over to the oscillator and then, then back again. The trouble with this, of course, is if you're going to make a whole bunch of different kinds of recordings, one customer wants this long, another customer wants that long. Uh, <clears throat> you have to make a whole bunch of, of these recordings for, for timing. Uh, when we change over to the, to the fourth system, we were able to factor the voice announcements and then actually assemble the talk on the fly. So as it was going along, it would, would uh, put together the speed and the frequency and so forth and announce it. The, the programs for making the tapes, as I say, we, we have capacity for a thousand of those. And we've used up much of those. And a typical one, uh, when it runs, it says dark, which makes the which erases what's on the screen and it plots on the screen it'll say program 101 g1 format all signals at 0 db then it runs startup uh, which sets the different parameters for recording and and starts the recording and it says 0 db 1000 hertz vox tone now the Hertz Vox tone is um, a word that sets the frequency of the oscillator. It runs the voice, the appropriate voice announcement, which it looks up in a table, plays the tone for a time that's in the lookup table, uh, and plots that as it goes. Then it says 500 hertz vox tone, 8,000 hertz vox tone, 16,000 hertz vox tone. <coughs> vox response tones, which is one that plot. Can I have the the block diagram? Block no the uh, plot plot yeah again. which are all of these things that are shown here and here and plots and makes the tape and you know we can make anything that, that is within the physical possibility just by writing a file that describes what to do. And of course, there are zillions of, of programs behind it that, that um, for, are for administrative reasons, which are too tedious to read here. And that's it. If there are questions, I'd be glad to answer. 
So, uh, Jay? Yes. Uh, the interface to the signal generators and stuff. Yeah. Is it GPIB slash IEEE 488, that sort of thing, or serial port, or? It's just. Uh, on off? Yeah. It's a, it's a, um, a, a binary value sent to, to a bus. And this speed bus that's on the block diagram, is that an analog signal or a digital signal? It's, it's uncoded 4-bit digital. It turned out, it, it, I forget, well, there was a reason for that. Um, I think the, the little chips that, that code different ways either were not available or we didn't understand them <laughs> at the time. But uh, there's uh, three of them are set to zero at any given time and there's one to set to one. And that tells the, the transport what speed to go. The transport has, as I say, it has this induction motor that runs full speed with full line voltage. And then it has a tachometer on it and a, a, a frequency detector that controls the voltage to the motor. So it makes a motor speed servo. Wow. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. You're quite welcome, man. You got the mic. While Brad makes his way to the front, I just wanted to say that there I was, and the year was 1970, and I was working, seven, actually late 70s, and I was working in a college radio sta station as an engineer. I had a third class radio tell with broadcast endorsement. I was licensed. <laughs> so we had to align up tape recorders and I, I learned from this I learned this from somebody that actually knew what the hell they were doing. And that's when I first came across this product. So uh, there I was and I didn't uh, know Jay, but Everybody that needed to do this job, with very few exceptions, a large majority of them were using this product. And certainly all of them knew about this product and for some reason of their own chose not to use it. If, uh, if you want, uh, to have a, your own copy of the block diagram, there are some of them uh, floating around in the room. If uh, Andy's got a question in the back, let me dash over there. I've got a for Jay this time. Yes, uh, Jay's still here. Yeah, uh, are you using G Force also, and are you using the the dash fast version? No, that was covered in the talk. This was uh, coal-fired antique DOS version FPC. Exactly. And he went over that. <laughs> so uh, some of us were in the bathroom at the time, but I, I feel confident that it was covered. <laughs> so Brad looks like he's one of the most prepared people here. And I'm sorry to hold him up. I would like to say thank you, Brad, for managing the stream and all the other details. And he knows how to do it. Indeed. <laughs> All righty. Um, so some caveats. Uh, simplicity is in the eye of the beholder, and uh, you know what what. You, you fancy a simple, uh, I might not find simple either. Um, and uh, another, another thing that occurred to me as I was preparing this presentation and uh, partially incompletely pre preparing it 
uh, is that there are a bunch of folks that have preceded me and, and I am no doubt retreading uh, some turf that uh, they have uh, uh, trod on before. Uh, so um, actually prompted me to, to put something up and, and uh, I, I wanted you all to encourage you all to, uh, it, there's not much here, uh, but to take a look. Um, basically I realized that there's a lot of uh, sort of history to how uh, the particular choice of, uh, of, of words and their definitions and the sort of lineage uh, of those words uh, was chosen. And, and a lot of the, the folks here uh, were involved in, in that process and, and uh, sort of reasoning through the, um, uh, the evolution of, of, of those choices of words. Um, I, for a handful of, 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 of ones that sort of came top of mind to me, I. Uh, put them up on GitHub and, and with some description and documentation of how I understood their evolution. Most of the ones there, I think, are, are ones sort of uh, in, involved in some of the standards, but in between the various standards, which is, as we all know, are sort of uh, a mixed bag, uh, there, there was a bunch of additional evolution, and I, I sort of had this aspiration that, you know, maybe it would be nice to record why uh, some of them are that way, particularly uh, an example, uh, you know, the, the evolution of create does and, and builds does and, and all of that. It's like, oh, there's this sort of an interesting, you know, sort of patterning here of, of things being enclosed in less than, greater than. Uh, and, and I feel like it's not really captured anywhere. So anyways. Um, so the motivation uh, for this talk was uh, actually uh, try to, to run something on my Mac and it didn't work. Um, the, uh, starting uh, with uh, OS X uh, 1015, uh, they've dropped support for 32-bit applications uh, even running on the, uh, uh, on the OS. They, they've actually just dropped library support. The kernel support is ostensibly still there, um, but there's not a lot you can do without sort of the, the, you know, the basic SOs to bring up the system. Um, they apparently just in October as well for Ubuntu tried to say, oh, we'll just turn off support for all the 32-bit packages. They got a flurry of, uh, of uh, negative uh, uh, reaction from uh, folks in the game community because uh, frequently they use Wine. Wine relies upon 32-bit. Um, they dialed that back a little, but the, the, the actual uh, reaction was to say, well, for some of these key packages that are required for Wine, we'll keep things on life support, and um, but I don't expect that will will uh, last forever or, or for very long. Um, another another example of this uh, trend at play is uh, with the Android ecosystem. Um, they they recently have required developers to to be sure to upload a 64-bit app even for phones where uh, you know with ARM chips it's not universal yet that everything's 64-bit, but it's getting to the point where uh, their folks are starting to nudge. Um, so. Uh, and yeah, to capture the sentiment, uh, or rather the lack of sentiment, uh, the key, this is a, a commit from Linus Torvalds dropping some support for 32-bit in, in the kernel, and uh, you know, his comment, well, not sentimental, good riddance. So 32-bit's so uh, uh, on its way out. Um, this has some bearing on fourth, although fourth lives in a world unto its own, and so to, to a degree we are insulated. But uh, for those of us who, who uh, operate on uh, on systems that are uh, have OSs, uh, there is a little concern. Swift fourth, for example, uh, has some interesting requirements. They very carefully on their website they must be aware that this has happened because they list support up through 1014 and not to 1015, where they drop support for libraries. Uh, similarly, if you're misfortunate to have a, a Linux that doesn't have uh, the, the appropriate 32-bit library support, you simply can't even run uh, Swift 4. Um, G4 is in better shape uh, simply because it was designed to be portable and, and, and neutral in terms of machine word size. So basically, uh, this just made me sad. And, and you know, the general concern is that uh, the world is you know, sort of piling on complexity. 64-bit instruction sets are, are really complex uh, beasts and are kind of unpleasant. They, they're sort of, you know, we, we've accumulated with x86 uh, you know, one layer of cruft on top of the last. Um, they have all kinds of interesting and strange calling conventions, especially when you're on the OX, the so-called red zones, where you need to leave some area uh, on, uh, in the stack that's sort of uh, off limits, uh, things of that sort. Um, the, um, the <laughs> you wanted the, the uh, in situ sort of pose, right? Um, the, um, 
the other thing is that in general, like this trend has kind of prevailed, even though it's not always great. Like there are a lot of cases where you get much lower code density, and much worse cash flow, uh, cash uh, coherence with uh, it, it, using 64-bit. You could use you know an X32 model where you use 32-bit pointers, even within within a, a 32-bit system to get more code density, but doesn't matter because for a lot of these OSs, the most important thing is to have kind of one configuration. Um, it's, it's just, you know, if you've got a gigantic complicated thing, having multiple variants of it is unpleasant. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, so this, this makes me, made me sad. So, after some, some grieving, I thought, well, okay, let's at least try to think about what, what can be the upside of this, this general sort of trend towards greater complexity in the world. Um, for fourth, I mean, there's this little things. I mean, you know, I, I, I generally defy you to, to, to uh, you know, find a lot of use cases where 64 bits isn't enough that, that you would need uh, double length words. So, so maybe we can, you know, sort of dispense with that in certain contexts. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, you could do interesting things if you've got, you know, a, a fourth implemented in C. Uh, packing things into a single machine word, but again, you're doing this on top of the, the abstraction of the hardware, so it's not that exciting. And 32 bits was actually quite a bit to, for this sort of thing. So the one thing that, that that sort of sprang to mind was at least you you know 64 bits is a lot of a lot of space. It's eight bytes, eight letters, and you know even if you don't do anything particularly clever, so so maybe we could do that. There's some precedent for packing things in. The color fourth uh, already checked uh, quite a bit ago was uh, taking 32 bit uh, uh, cells and and. Uh, Using only a mere 28 bits of them to get uh, uh, whole words uh, fit in. If you're careful about the encoding, if you uh, do uh, something that's sort of weighted by the, the frequency of the, uh, the letters, you can get an interesting uh, amount of density. Um, I, I'm told from some of the green arrays folks, occasionally this would tend to brim over, and of course you kind of wished you had that little bit more. I mean, there's an affordance to spill into the next word, although sort of not not significantly. So that's that's nice. Um, there's a, there's a, for those of you unacquainted with it, there's a great uh, doc on this, the very obscure, at least in the U.S., uh, uh, variant of the 4th E language is DSSP. Uh, it was done for ternary computers. They were very big on the notion of uh, one word of, uh, of source text being uh, one, one word of machine code. So there's maybe some synergy there. Uh, it, just minor segue, it, it, they've got uh, the general choices they try to avoid uh, having uh, immediate words and instead have uh, words that, that know how to manipulate sort of the next set of words uh, following them and leads to some interesting simplifications, but yeah, anyways, let me not dwell on that. Um, in, in thinking about this and looking, looking through some of the fourths in my, uh, you know, I have the source to, um, it, it dawned on me that there's a kind of an odd thing about fourth that I had never thought of before, which is um, we, we use a bunch of characters, you know, it's a very uh, a punctuation heavy language, you know, brackets and at signs and number signs, but why don't we generally tend to use caps and, and tildes and whatnot? And, and I noticed something interesting in E4th and in, in Dr. Ting's implementation, there's this interesting uh, ending with uh, phi, 5F, uh, which as it turns out is, is, a, is a clever way to, to uh, keep you at a certain range. So if you look at a certain range with characters, if you look at ASCII, and uh, uh, the control characters are in, um, uh, in orange there, um, there's this interesting thing where, you know, these are, these are the, the, the symbols we actually use, for, at least in a lot of traditional fourths. We don't tend to have these, and I'm assuming this, there's some history here. This is, would be a great example of one of those sort of, you know, why did we stick to this, this set? I'm assuming it was somebody trying to be efficient on an Apple II or something. Um, the, uh, so that's kind of, kind of cool that there's really only these, these 64 characters that we care about. Um, that's actually, you know, yeah, so it's basically a six-bit character set that, that's frequently used. That's a bit of a lie. I was noticing actually looking through the, uh, the Ansforth standard, there's actually two words that, that, that breach this. There's uh, uh, F proximate, which I was not even aware existed. Apparently it uh, allows you to uh, uh, do a, uh, a range comparison um, with floating point numbers, which is a strange thing to have that particular kind of operator for. And then, of course, it had, and I spent, said locale, it's a typo, it's locals, not locales. Um, it tells you about the world I've been dealing with at work. So, with a, with a few exceptions, though, this is great. We, uh, there are some that aren't used, and I would be fascinated to know if there's some history around 
why those were we we uh, why percent and carrot and, and underscore are sort of more 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 or less frequently present. Um, related to this, there's digit conversion, which um, you know you see patterns like this uh, in in fourths to be able to uh, sort of pithily convert from uh, a numeric digit value to uh, to the appropriate ASCII character, and there's all these clever uh, terse versions of this, such as an e, an e fourth, to avoid having to you know do a table or or do sort of explicit conditions. Um, so uh, you could do something else while you're sort of fiddling with the character set. You could you know arrange things so that you've got maybe uh, the numbers and and letters in sequence, such that that, that makes things simpler. So there's possibilities there. Um, the, um, there's some things you can do with parsing of numbers that makes it even easier, sort of mirroring color for, uh, again, if you tag and, and pre-parse your, your uh, numbers, that's uh, one less thing to, to worry about at uh, compile time. So that's a, and you, uh, as it turns out, if you're going to use a 6-bit character and 64 bits, you've got 4 bits left over. So, um, so at this point, um, I then sort of had the thought process that I, what I wanted to do was to uh, uh, go back and look at some of the some of the fourths I had worked on and sort of think about how they would be impacted. Um, something I, I encourage you all. I don't know. I actually haven't gone back to check how effective the recording uh, of this was, but uh, earlier this year I did a, a talk on. Um, uh, sort of compare, went through um, the, uh, a, a somewhat famous book on uh, a Lisp programming and sort of made some comparisons with fourth. As part of that, I, I made this sort of uh, uh, fourth at the level of abstraction uh, that typically, typically when folks will present uh, Lisps, they will uh, you know brag about how compact and, and concise the description of, of lisps can be, um, but they will often do it sort of uh, glossing over parsing and glossing over uh, the aspects of parsing that are that are hard and challenging and tedious. Um, and so I had a, a, a fourth I called circle fourth that uh, was a mere, actually well here we'll look at line count, uh, it was a mere uh, 84 lines for the sort of core of it and then 85 lines for uh, sort of a, some compound words. Um, it uses, uh, and I don't know how well we can, let's see, let me zoom in a little. Woo. Um, it uses, uh, uh, it, it uses the same kind of pattern you frequently see in, in uh, uh, sort of toy lisps where they'll, uh, they'll sort of build a, a simple machine on top of uh, the current, uh, the current uh, fourth, or sorry, the current lisp and then uh, sort of re-implement lisp in that way. So I, Similar to that, you know, go and implement an R stack, and and uh, that's often in some other area, uh, and then have the the core interpreter sort of just in a loop uh, with a, an instruction pointer and uh, and executing uh, the words that it encounters, um, and then you know if you'll notice here, it's like a lot of the plumbing that's left is all about even parsing, leveraging the existing fourth that's there. There's quite a bit of uh, plumbing to accomplish that. Um, but then, uh, fairly easily, you know, most of what's left in a fourth at that point is just dictionary search and word creation, which is a, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, and then in this particular fourth, because I'm just leaning on on the, the fourth that's underneath, I can just have some pass throughs to uh, all the core primitives, um, and then reimplement, and then all the primitives that I've reimplemented above. Um, and that gives me just enough that I can then have the the uh, the uh, interpreter loop and have it parse words uh, using using the, par the the parser of the outer fourth. Um, and then at this point, I've got just enough to have comments and then transition into uh, fourth that's now running sort of in that kernel and then do a bunch of those kinds of words, uh, which I won't belabor. Whoa, I won't belabor that. Um, so, so anyways, this gives you this nice, this is running on top of G fourth, but gives you this nice uh, little mini fourth that uh, has sort of all the things. Uh, I even went so far as to, here, let's see, we'll, uh, I went so far as to do create does even, uh, so, you know, something like, uh, 
or I should, sorry, that was not what I meant. Let's do adder. Of course, live demo fail we'll, we'll get. So, so then we could do an adder. I can't spell. Can't spell. So something like that. Um, so, so anyways, um, the, the key insight there is just that most of that fourth was either the parser or was leaning on the parser. Um, and, and so a lot of the complexity is there. Let's pop back to the slides. Um, the actual thing that prompted this line of thought was uh, I've been working uh, with uh, Don and, and uh, Dr. Ting on a, a version of uh, eForth that runs uh, on these uh, robot boards. And similar, and what I had done at some point, and here, let me demo that, um, is I uh, restructured that forth to, uh, to do a number of things, one of which was to um, uh, be able to run on the, on the native system in addition to running on the board, so I could not have to debug running on the boards because we're struggling with running on the boards, amongst other things. Um, so uh, to, to give you a sense, uh, this this is a, a little bit bigger than Circle Fourth. It's 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 815 lines. Um, I actually uh, Dr. Ting I think hasn't even seen this. I, I went through and uh, made some. Ooh, that's not what I want to run. Made some simplifications to it. Um, uh, in particular, uh, there's a technique that uh, that you can use in C called an X macro. So I was able to sort of pull out all the primitives and their implementations. Uh, Terse, fairly tersely. Um, a bunch of this complexity here is I've actually got file words because on the, the ESP board I can actually now do files. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of plumbing for headers and then uh, macros are defined twice. Once uh, inside of uh, uh, ESP fourth uh, for, for, for one time it's within C and then a second time. Uh, but what all of this lets you do and he, he's making a face. <laughs> uh, what, this, what all this lets you do uh, is make the definitions uh, even more pithy. And so uh, once you get down to the sort of core of E4th, you can have you know, words like key done with begin, question key, until exit, and uh, just sort of done directly. So, so all that's even more compact than, uh, than uh, the thing that I inherited there. Um, it was a little bit of a challenge to tweak this to work in 64 bits. Uh, just because there had been some uh, assumptions uh, built in, but you know, I, I baked in some uh, uh, some macros for cell size and a bunch of places. If you look for size of cell T, um, I, I ended up um, oops, not down here in the actual core of the thing. Oops, um, in a bunch of places uh, where where cell size matters uh, in eight versus uh, in eight versus uh, sixty yeah eight bit bytes versus four bytes um, all of that's there so you can run the same fourth and we'll, Don will talk about this more and on the on the board um, but it's got you know a range of stuff um, not least of which it uh, has a uh, the ability to uh, Load a load a boot file, uh, so this this uh, this boot file gets scanned for, and so you're able to have that loaded uh, from the file system and do things of that sort. Oh, Brad? Yes. I will I'm almost almost to the end of the end of my slides here. Oh, you're awesome. Okay, so um, in general, uh, you'll, and you'll notice there's a hodgepodge here. What I uh, what I had intended to do was to to, to show a a fourth that it had some of these tricks around strings. Um, I will actually very quickly show uh, that I've got a, th a work in progress thing called uh, Biddy Fourth where I have uh, oops, that's not what I want to show. Uh, where I have uh, got a uh, sort of uh, very simple parser that's done in C, so I can sort of uh, get that complexity uh, from C, and then uh, it defines uh, sort of 
close to the moral equivalent of a uh, of what Colorforth does, but with these six-bit encodings uh, and a little bit of statefulness. Uh, and so this is just a mirror, you know, 160 lines. Um, and then there, and then from there it it goes, and there's uh, a bunch of words that are implemented uh, as as uh, native x64 machine code. Um, and uh, oops, and then uh, there's a little bit of uh, OS specific plumbing right now just for terminate and type. Um, and then I'm able to have a have a uh, the boot program load. Um, there's a bug right now, um, and so I can print the grand total of what I can actually print is one star uh, 40, 42 emit. Um, something is not happening right inside of the implementation of uh, type such that it's unable to return. Um, but uh, the the most interesting bit of this is just that these two words entry. So entry is a like a thunk to transition from C into this uh, machine level fourth. And then uh, I also implement C comma so that I can then transition to having colon definitions to uh, do the rest. And so at this point, it's, it's sort of uh, relying less and less on the, the interpreter that was implemented in C. Uh, and the, the, the eventual goal is to transition just to a native fourth uh, and all of that. Um, overall, um, Interfacing with the OS is, is challenging, and uh, there's uh, a lot of complexity there. I still struggle with what the right pattern is for that. Um, you know, what, whether, whether the OS is something you want to leverage or not, and to what degree, whether you want to interface at the level of syscalls, at the level of uh, dynamic symbols, um, whether you want to have an API that you sort of code up custom and see. Um, I, you know, it's where do you want to put your, your complexity, and, and I, I guess the thing uh, the thing I figure is that um, what uh, what's what's valuable is to uh, is to uh, yeah <laughs> uh, what's valuable is to is to find that right uh, break off uh, between what you want to get from the OS and uh, if you're going to use something from the OS you should have the whole thing if you're going to use files have all the files and, and use that if you're you know just you know call a handful of syscalls operate at that level. Uh, don't try to be halfway about it. Um, if you are going to wrap something, uh, I've seen in a bunch of the, the, the various experiments that I've done is that, you know, if what I want is pixels on the screen, and I don't actually want windows and GUIs and whatever, then it's fine to paper over something, use, use what's there, but don't, don't even try to leak any, any low-level detail about that because you'll inherit all of the complexity uh, from the OS. Uh, but if you can avoid it, that's that's the best. Um, and portability is is just this evil temptation. You think you can write it in such a way that it will be portable, but that just doesn't ever work. Um, I, actually, I didn't. I had more slides than I thought, and I will kind of gloss over these. Um, one other thing that I was that I w was going to address in the context of that uh, uh, little demo I had is uh, there's a t there's a kind of a weird tug and pull with parsers in fourth. Um, you can currently, you know, conventional fourth, you have words like word and parse and create that uh, sort of uh, uh, are driven by the interpreter, and then you have uh, things that are driven by the outer loop, and that's, that's actually pretty weird. Um, color fourth solution to this is very cool. It's almost all parser driven, but the downside is it's all sort of stateful. It's in a, you know, in a, in a call table, um, but, it's, but it doesn't have a lot of the same wrinkles because you're, it's all one way. Uh, it, you know, it's not sort of the halfway pattern. Another possibility would be sort of coroutines where you sort of yield back and forth to the parser. This might generalize, and that was actually kind of where I was headed with this, uh, with Biddy Forth, but we'll, we'll see where that goes. It's also, I, I've actually got a partial implementation in the repository for those that want to go poke at it, uh, of how you might uh, go back and forth. Uh, between the parser and the interpreter to pull things out a word at a time. It's a lot easier if you can fit a single uh, string and you know, a single word in one machine word and not have to worry about how you have strings transit that boundary. But I don't know. It seems more complex. Uh, for now, it's what I've got in there is similar to color for. Um, questions, and we should transition to robots. Hello. Let me walk over there. Um, and I'll even walk over with these folks in tow. We have remote. Uh, Green Array's folks, too, so they can. <laughs> okay. Hey there. Uh, how much of your work at work is uh, in fourth? Um, 
That's a great question. You mean professional work or professional, professional work? Uh, uh, zero. Um, the bulk of my work is in is in a range of languages, C plus plus and, and Java. And, That's uh, what I was afraid of. Yes, indeed. I had the same experience up until when I retired 18 years ago. Yes, indeed. So uh, I I I have this this goal of finding a, a good place in my in my uh, day job to to use more forth, but it's uh it's hard. <laughs> So um, is, is it mature enough to compare execution speed between the 32-bit and 64-bit? Uh, uh, something that you expect to be reasonable? Uh, so I mean, for some of these that are, so for, um, for example, with ESP4, th um, you could certainly compare the two. And I suspect that if you did, it, you, would, you would see a noticeable degradation in performance. On, on a lit like my Linux box, I can still run both 32 and 64-bit executables. So you could do a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, the you know uh, I think this is a general sort of theme. There's a, there's a, uh, there's pros and cons to using bigger size pointers. If you need that much memory, if you need to uh, deal with something that large, but of course, what are you doing with that much memory? So, sorry. Was there any any movement in the other direction? I know they used to have these things called bit slice computers, which were like one bit wide, and you could just stack a number. So, so I mean, certainly in the in the context of, of, of FPGAs, there's a there's a lot of movement in the direction of, of sort of doing things at whatever granularity you want on device. So there certainly, uh, I think in term, you know, I have a tendency to do a lot of work in, within uh, sort of conventional OSs, and there, unfortunately, the trend is just towards growing bigger, complexity. Bigger. Yeah. yeah. Stop talking, Brad. Yep. All righty. Let me hand over the talking stick to Don. And well, I will try to carefully bring up a demo if you. <laughs> so what I told him is at the, my 25-minute mark, I'm going to call you up, and you can show off the port. Okay. So, all right. So I'll. Okay, my talk is on fourth AIM robotics and the future. And where's full screen on this thing? <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, that's weird. It's different on my. Um, All right, well, I guess it's working. So, <clears throat> my talk is on fourth AI and robotics in the future. Um, what makes a uh, language popular is a killer app or, or a um, program. 
We need a killer app for Forth. That's what we need. Um, Forth has some very unique properties that no other languages have. Um, you know, maybe you know, Lisp and, Sm Lisp and Smalltalk have some some of the Forth stuff, but um, yeah. It is. Is it working? Yes, it is. It okay. only works over the internet, not locally. <laughs> so, um, as you know, uh, involved with Brad and Dr. Ting, uh, we're designing, this is the first um, version of the board for intelligent robotics. This is um, kind of a, a state-of-the-art upgraded board from my Whiskers robot. I think I demonstrated that last fourth day, last year. So I didn't bring it. But um, it has a lot more, a um, lot, lot more things on it. We're going to make this open source, open hardware. So we're going to try to get the uh, maker community uh, enthusiastic. I used to be technical vice president of the Southern California, the Robotic Society of Southern California. The president was a C programmer. I was a fourth programmer. And during the ten years that I was doing that, um, he and I had a, a, a very um, intense competition of which language was better. He was a C guy, I was a fourth guy. And of course I always kicked his butt in the games. But, um, you know, the point is we want to make intelligent machines that are smart enough to make the decisions themselves. How is a machine intelligent when it runs a billion times a second, but it's the programmer solved the problem? We want the machine to solve the problem. And yes, we can go into deep learning and other things like that, where they're, um, you know, they programmed this stuff in C, but it's a monster app, you know, and it takes a lot of CPU power. Um, Forth can do this. Um, this is a 32-bit processor with 400K. I don't know what on earth we're going to build a, you know, I mean, it's just way too much for Forth. <laughs> you know, we can do a real strong AI in 400K of, uh, with a 32-bit fourth. So um, that's kind of where we're going. That's, that's the future. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk shortly uh, just about my, my job. Um, I got the best job on Earth. We're out working for a company called Made in Space. And their company was started nine years ago. Um, when I was hired on, there was 45 people. That was January um, 21st. And today, there are 90 people. They just got a $74 million contract for um, robotic, especially a robotic spacecraft for manufacturing um, solar panel arrays in space, which I'm going to show you in a minute. <coughs> um, the first thing they did when I showed up, um, they hired me as a, I'm a um, senior electrical engineer is my official job title. But I do a lot of coding and stuff, too. Um, so, um, we have this unit called the Recycler. It was just launched uh, a few weeks ago. And it's a space station payload. And what they do is they take 3D printed parts, or they take plastic bags or other trash on the space station. They put it in the Recycler. It grinds it all up. It, it, it remelts it, and it makes new filament so they can you know, use a 3D printer to make new parts. So you get to recycle things. And my very first board they put me on uh, is in that unit. So I, I have a board in space. <laughs> Not be a little bit of a Trojan horse there. So this is called Arcanaut 1. It's the spacecraft slash robot. Um, they've tasked me to, to um, create the computer that actually runs both the uh, robot arm and what we call um, the ESAM. It's the extruder for, for 3D printing. Our 3D printers print continuously and forever. So you can make a structure as long as you want in space. Because there's no gravity weight on it, you know, it's not going to bow or anything, and you can make it as long as you want. <coughs> Yeah, okay. So the question was, do you have long structures, do they vibrate? Um, yeah, we have, uh, 
materials, you know, scientists on staff that are working with that sort of thing. Um, I really can't answer that question, but I do hear conversations about things like that. And so they are, you know, that's, you know, people are talking about that in the company and coming up with solutions and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> this chart here, um, this is the ISS solar panel size. And uh, that's a typical European space uh, you know, solar panel size this is a geosat. The blue is what we can do. <laughs> so, because we're going to 3D print it in space. So the, the Arconaut will 3D print, uh, I think it's one meter by 30 meter long uh, solar panel. So basically, as it's printing, it's un unrolling solar film. So the solar film is, you know, the solar cell, right? And um, solar film is lower efficiency than a solar cell, but when you have unlimited room, you know, you can spool it up and it's very tiny. You know, the cost um, to build things in space is getting the raw material up there. So if we can 3D print structures in space, we're just sending up spools of material. And then you build this huge, you know, lattice beam, for example. <clears throat> so this is Arconaut. I think this is a video. Yeah. So it's a two-minute video. Oh, I'm not online. Yeah, let's see. Something happened here. I think the gods are punishing you for your impudence, and I think you're too long. <laughs> um, you got my, my entire presentation. Seven minutes, seven minutes now. My entire presentation isn't showing up. Once again, God's <laughs> punishing impudence. We've been over this. You just stuck in the window? See, look. Okay, so if I change it to there, or maybe I have to. Um, Yeah, that's, uh, I spell Windows, W-I-N-D-O-Z-E. That's how I spell Windows. Okay, so, slideshow. Oh, come on, what is that? So, uh -oh. this may seem like a silly-ass question. What okay. more do you have to tell us? Oh, wait, it's back. <laughs> All right, I guess, uh, well, if you go on YouTube, put in uh, Arconaut One Robot, you can actually see it. And if you send the link to Dave Jaffe, he'll put it in the meeting notes. So, um, we, uh, the robot has to be radiation tolerant, so this is, um, I'm new to radiation tolerant type design, but we, um, our team leader is an expert, so he's... He's, uh, I'll, I'll be designing the PC board and I'll be designing all the software and system verilog on an FPJ. 
FPJs are radiation tolerant. So we're going to use uh, RIS-5, and then in the fabric, I'm writing system bear log code, and that's controlling all of the motors and things. So an FPJ is a multi-processing machine, not multitasking. So each one of those processes that's running some external device is running in real time at up to 100 megahertz. <coughs> Um, so anyway, so now we're getting to this project. So we're basically, uh, you know, I designed the Trium architecture 25 years ago, and as someone who's been in robotics, I'm like, where's the beef? Um, the only robots that really impress me is from Boston Dynamics. Uh, everything else is stupid. Um, it just amazes me. You know, it's been 25 years. <coughs> So, this is actually out of my manual. You notice copyright 95. <laughs> so, um, I developed this three-tiered um, operating system on uh, fourth, it, and I'm, I was using Max fourth at the time, 68AC11, uh, 64K of RAM, or a memory space, I should say. And um, it breaks it down. It turns out I was solving an engineering problem, which is how to build an intelligent machine. When I was done, I had emulated nature. I emulated the way God designed us. So this is, I was at a trade show and a biologist told me this. So cerebral cortex is like your goal level, that's like your main loop. Limbic system is semi-atomic processes like breathing. Um, so your body system is doing things, but you can override them, right? <coughs> um, there are also, in the behavior system, um, it, so it's, um, it's multitasking, it's preemptive, uh, preemptive multitasking on, between the instinct level and everything above, but between behaviors and goals, it's cooperative. <coughs> I talked about that last year, I won't go into too much detail. So this is a new board. Um, from a marking perspective, if you search on AIBot, it's used a lot, but nobody grabbed it, so I grabbed it. The idea in internet marketing, you want to choose a keyword that people are already using, and then your stuff will show up. <laughs> so I, we kind of went through a couple different um, names, but that's one we're selling on. Um, <clears throat> so it's an R&D project. It's a new processor for me. We got some glitches. I'm going to do another board spin. Cost me about a grand, so. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to do another one. Because, oh, this is what works today. So we, we flash D4 on it. Um, the serial port works. Switching power supply works. The flash programming is intermittent. Um, Dr. Ting would like the Arduino IDE e working, but it's not. But the Wi Fi does work. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> Um, the features, a 30-bit processor, um, it's a single core 32-bit micro, 200 MIPS, 448K of ROM, uh, 520K of SRAM, I guess I lied on that. Um, it's got 802.11, FCC approved. So this is a system on module, it's actually a, a little circuit board. Um, so we don't have to go through FCC, but it's got Bluetooth and um, and Wi-Fi. So the features are we got uh, dual brush DC motors. 12 it's a 12 runs on 12 volts. Use 12 volt motors. Four LED optical sensors. Two filters. I added a magnetometer, inclinometer, accelerometer to it, so it's going to be able to sense a lot. What I found is <clears throat> after I created the original whiskers, it was very useful to have a compass when you're doing navigation. So. <clears throat> If I tell the robot to go at, say, 360 degrees, and then it, it does collision avoidance, well, see, now it's off. Where I want to go is maybe at 6 degrees. So if with that three-level architecture, if I have a behavior that's trying to get, you know, focus on the heading, then the interaction between the three layers, the robot will automatically and instantaneously instantaneously do collision avoidance, but get back on, on track. So, <clears throat> because I hadn't put the hardware in the original whiskers, 
I actually cheated and made a compass out of the pulse width modulation. So every time I changed the pulse width modulation width, I would either add it or decrement it to a, a memory variable. <coughs> and I created this kind of pseudo, um, uh, pseudo compass. Um, on the next board spin, um, microprocessors are very, can be very fussy about resets. The, I got the board from, I think it was um, ADR Fruit, the schematic. So I'm going to add this. I think that's a lot of our problem is we're not, re the reset isn't working the way that um, the micro needs it. The ADR Fruit design had just had a cap and a pull-up resistor. So I'm going to add this. It'll create a square wave into the reset pin. Um, so these are some of the, um, the features of... Um, AI robotics, you know, th this is what's, I'll just finish on this slide. Um, think about C, what Will Baden used to call the profane languages. <clears throat> um, if, you, if you have a robot that's intelligent and you're going to teach it, you need an incremental compiler. Are you going to compile a whole application because you changed one line of code? You taught the robot something new, a new, a new um, routine? Are you going to recompile the whole bloody uh, uh, system? Fourth, you don't have to. It's an incremental compiler. It's interpreter. It's already, we can, we can talk to a fourth board through the serial port. Um, there's a $50 uh, speech board at the Maker Fair, which we have, uh, and we're going to put that as a front end. <coughs> um, OS required, obviously, and efficient use of resources. So to me, AI Robotics is fourth killer app. That's it. Oh, this is a funny fact. <laughs> um, okay, so while C++ is slow to write, error prone, and frequently unreadable, Python is known for its writability, error reduction, and readability. When I was preparing the slides, I ran across that, and I just l had to laugh. I, you know, I, I make a living writing C, and I just had a big experience with pointers. If you've ever done pointer, all I wanted to do was store a value in a memory location. How hard is that? And with C, it was a nightmare. I, I got it. I don't know that if it works, but I got it to compile. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so in terms of uh, uh, status, we've been sort of working around the, the, the limitations of the hardware, as it were. Um, uh, it's a challenge to get the thing to flash because, unfortunately, the... Um, oh, great. No, ah, here we go. That'll do. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, the, um, uh, the flash, uh, th there's a, a flash chip that comes up separate from the, the CPU. So it's possible to come up in a state where the, the, uh, the CPU is up and you can communicate with it and all seems well, but you can't actually, uh, talk to the flash. Um, the, um, however, uh, the interesting thing is it seems to be at least partial, partially perturbed by, uh, the USB port. So uh, it will, it's more robust booting when it's actually not plugged in. Um, let me first show it. Uh, so I, I've got a, so what I've got was that ESP4 that I've shown on there. It has files and can read and write to the flash on the device. Um, it's set up so that it goes out to the flash, treating it as a FAT file system. Looks like, it looks for a file called boot and uh, loads that. And I've put into, for this particular board, I put into it a, a thing that uh, flashes the LED some number of times and then uh, goes and uh, uh, prints some things out to the serial port and then goes back to the fourth console. I do that because I don't actually, it's a real pain to flash these uh, to give you a sense like you have to sort of plug it in, unplug it, plug it in, unplug it, you know, 30 times before it will uh, decide it's going to do happy things. And of course the demo, we have demo fail. That's great. Okay, hold on. Da, 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 da. Don't do that. 
this particular board unfortunately is not wired the right way either, which is why I've got a... Alright, let me... And that flashing routine is written in four. That flashing routine is now written in four. That's not loading. Why is that not loading? That's how the world grows harder. That's not loading. What's going on? Uh, okay. Oh, I plugged it into the wrong pin. That's well, he's why. Doing that. I want to say, I hope you're going to join us for dinner. Uh, it's what, Faye? So, uh, but, All right. uh, that's the place we went for Ting's uh, birthday. Right. Minimal park. Ah. Minimal park. Uh, navigation, instructions, and think about joining us, and there'll be a sign up or something. Yeah, that, that works really great. So far, we've yeah. not ever gotten the right. consistent uh, result of that process. So. I, I have it in mind that you write your name on the board. I did the wrong pin again. Name and we'll count the first names that are written on the board. And you, okay. I'll take a picture of it, bring it to the restaurant, and if your name wasn't written up there, no food for you. <laughs> and you sit outside, it will be takeout. Because there won't be any room for you at the table. Mm -hmm. They may not let us in. They may be booked. <laughs> and I'm having demo fail, it seems. <laughs> Damn it. Anything you want to demonstrate that it works, it won't. Anything that you want to demonstrate that doesn't work, I've got this problem with my car, this weird noise. It'll work fine every time. You know, one of the other things I'm going to do is I'm going to put both resistors on the zero port. The way this works, and of course, you know, you have to build something to see all the issues. But, so it comes up 115K, but when it goes ah, up there we go. the flash, it goes up to 900K. Right. So that, I'm thinking that's part of the issue. It's from a hardware perspective, CMOS output pins don't have a lot of drive strength. Mm -hmm. you know, and so many times you have to pull up resistors on high speed. The, 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 the troubling and fa fascinating thing is this thing boots up. And the only reason I think it f succeeds when it's uh, standalone like this more readily is that it tries to load from flash and fails and, try and does a reboot and tries to load from flash. And so it's very random. Okay, so I think I got it. I'm happy. No. Really? Well, actually, wait. <laughs> Not touch. It will. Come on. Is that all right, Brad? Yes, it's fine. I, it's not going to. Come on. Really? Maybe it just needs light. It did, it did it a second ago, and then I. Okay, come on. Let's try again. One potato, two potato. Come on. It's okay. It's hardware. It's always like that. Yeah, hardware is not my. Yeah, it's okay. It's nobody's, so. No, no, no. Some just people just has. <laughs> More patience for yes. failures. Yes. <laughs> if I said anything nasty to any of you this morning, I'm very sorry. I apologize. Kevin, you've been delightful. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, in in preparation. What's it? The connector is bended. Uh, that's probably okay, but yeah, it's, it's not shorted. Yeah, it's. Hope yeah, it's not shorted. It's hopefully yeah. not shorted. Yeah. And this one's also. Yeah. Was it in a backpack or something? Yeah, this one's. Uh, had a that may be a problem. Maybe this this or this shorted as well. You see. Yeah. So this. One is of the, it supposed to be shorted? No, wait. Okay. So no. Hold on. Why? We got your seven. We got your water. We got your root beer. We got your diet. There. There. There it goes. I told you. Okay. It's all about context. Yeah. It's like if you don't solder something, well then. What is it? You got your coke. Take it. Oops. Uh huh. Yeah, so the problem is Don, Don had this one wired the, with the wrong pin on the LED, which is why I. Okay. We believe you. We believe you. I know. I know. It works. All right. I'm gonna hack this up. All right. Ah. Uh, so, uh, green erase, folks. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna actually have you transmit on a different laptop that I will hook up, and I'm gonna keep this one connected as well. To, uh, but let me see if I can get audio sorted out a minute for you.
Bring up the green arrays, folks. Did you want the talking stick? Oh yeah, sounds good. Let me let me. Uh, I just I, I mainly wanted. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh shoot! How did I do audio last time? Oh, I know. Shoot. Okay. I need to remove. How does this work? Uh, oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Uh, could, uh, Green Arrays folks, could you speak? Or you, you, you want the you, the screen? You should yeah, be. You should be. I voted. Um, are you are you sure? Uh, I'm I'm plugging. I'm I'm, I'm I'm screwing with the screen. I'm trying to mainly get the audio ready for them. Um, oh wait. Oh, I'm not actually in the hangout yet. One more time. Um, oh, you're muted. Let's see. Let's unmute you. Could you say something, Greg? I, oh, wow. I can't hear you, though. Okay, let's see. Let me figure out what's going on. Oh, I know why. Here. How's that? There we go. All right. Whoa. I, hold on, I need to, hold on, I, I know what's causing that, there we go, better? <laughs> okay, let me, let me do, oh, your audio sounds great actually, uh, it's on the loudspeaker, um, I need to make one more adjustment so you can hear better here, but, uh, and you're not up on, we, we can all hear your disembodied voice but not up on the screen just yet. So I'm working. I, we've got a demo running on the, on the machine there, but let me, uh, let me add that in. That's not going to, okay, let's see. Um, let's say setting. And microphone. All right. Can you hear me, Greg? Yes. Good. Not, not very loud. Not very loud. Can you can you hear me now? Beautifully. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So that I, I I think then then we're set up. Um, what I'll the only other thing actually let me let me check which network I'm on here. So I'm going to just leave you up for the. Oh, and I should turn off the broadcast to, to reset for you all, but. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong network here. Let me switch that round. So we get. Uh, I'm going to hang up on you briefly to get a better connection. So I'll be right back. 
Yes. I, I can hear you great, uh, Daniel. One second, though. I'll. Uh, So the demo is what's running right now. You might want to, yeah, I want to try the demo. But let's see. Uh, okay. Yeah, the screen is. All right. I'm going to actually, I'm going to hang up on this other connection. So over. Uh, Greg, can you hear me now? Oh, good. Not very loud, but oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. All right. And then let me. Um, I'm going to briefly switch. Actually. Yeah. Let's see. I think we're. I think we're good on the video. Um, let me plug one more and see if that works. And then I think we'll be good. Oh, I'm sorry, I just no, had to switch sources if you need to. Oh, yeah. No yeah. 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 Hold on one sec. Turn off the front set of uh, lights here. What's that? Oh, okay. Do you, let's see. Oh, I can't. That's not it. I see laptop uh, hmm. box lights. Uh, let's see. Listen up. Special announcement. If you want a fabulous SV Pig t shirt like this one, there's a box of them over there. Pay Andreas. Don't know who Andreas is.
Well, that's a nod. Is that going to go to that location? Um, say, uh, uh, Say, uh, Greg, you want to do a sound check? For this bit, but yeah. For the guest. Yeah, for the guest. Yeah, and, just filmed it. yeah, and I've and separately for for uh, Daniel, I've got a he's pre-recorded a video, so we're going to switch that round when. Oh, let me get that queued up, actually. Uh, Especially using two computers to do. That's yes, bad. yes, indeed. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I need to go to YouTube. Yeah, that's a good one. 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 Yeah, unfortunately not on the computer. I would have preferred. This board up here is really cool, by the way. Okay. Um... I need to be... That's not what I want. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm trying to get the other video queued up so I'll be able to play it, and this is behaving extremely slowly for some reason. Um, come on. Probably because it's on this terrible itty bitty computer. But, for, yeah. Um, uh, well, don't eat my pizza yet, but yeah. It's out there, mushroom and sausage. We've got like a whole spare pizza. If you want to throw in a buck or two for slice, that's fine. If not, All right, I'm going to not fiddle with that. Let me switch back on the demo. Yeah, it should come up. I'm going to go grab a bite to eat. We're going to switch over to the next broadcast, and I'm going to shut this one down for a second.